Okay, the time has come to move on from generating syngas to what we do with it once you have it. It is only appropriate historically and otherwise to begin that transition with efficient synthesis. I have counted at least eight cycles in the whimsical interest of the industry in fissure probes. And one of the criteria for success in this area is to survive as many cycles as possible. I have counted that the keynote speaker today has survived at least three of those cycles, and that makes him probably the record holder for durability in the area of fissure probes. Um, the keynote speaker for the entire uh, session, for the entire day, is Professor Calvin Bartholomew obtained his undergraduate degree at Brigham Young, then went on to uh, get a PhD at Stanford, Goudard, and then went on to spend one year in industry, as we almost do when we leave Professor Goudard's group, and came back to Brigham Young, where he has been ever since as a professor in the chemical engineering department. Um, the areas of interest, he needs no introduction, but I will do the introduction. It's the only visibility I get in this meeting. Um, <laughs> so uh, the areas where he, had, uh, he has had significant impact and influence go beyond fissure-trope synthesis. The use of MOS power spectroscopy, which was used as a tool in characterization of uh, fissure-trope catalysts, and also the area of deactivation of metallic catalysts, uh, places where Calvin has, made, has had a significant influence. In Fisher Tropes, I remember that there were very few people whose papers I always read as soon as they came out, and Calvin's was one of them. So when the subject came to mind as to who to pick, it was clear that Calvin was a great choice. So um, please take over the microphone. The title of his talk is going to be The Role of Surface Structure and Support in Fisher Probe Synthesis on Cobalt. Yeah. I better take it over before my head gets too big. Thanks for that nice introduction. <laughs> You know, we live in a rapidly changing world, and uh, one of the evidences of that is that uh, I have noticed, or, or it's my perception at least, that many of the catalyst technologies that we're talking about at this meeting were not even around when I was a graduate student at Stanford some 25 years ago. And I imagine that may be true of some of these technologies for some of you who were in graduate school just five years ago. In, in other words, uh, at the rate at which uh, technology is advancing, uh, we could expect that in another 25 years, we're going to see a lot of new catalyst technologies. And one of the questions we might ask is, what's going to be there in 25 years? Now that's a dangerous question to try to answer, uh, but I'd like to take out my crystal ball and try it anyway. And the uh, question I'd like to ask is, uh, what's going to be the principal source of liquid fuels in 2020? Well, uh, what we do know is that petroleum resources will be on the decline, since they already are on the decline. Uh, and we also know that uh, world gas reserves, uh, about 100 years at present use of, uh, or present rates of use, uh, will still be around in important resources, uh, although 50% of these are located in remote locations of the world. And uh, we know that we have coal reserves for using uh, these uh, resources, natural gas and I think one of the possibilities is what I refer to as uh, wax crack technology or Fisher Tropsch and uh, this is the, in my view the most technically advanced and economical route to liquid hydrocarbons from natural gas and coal. And we have two options. Uh, we can take natural gas and make a syngas uh, by partial oxidation, as was discussed earlier this morning, um, and then do a fischer tropsch synthesis with a, co a cobalt catalyst to produce um, a wax, which is then hydrocracked to metal distillates. Or we can gasify coal uh, to produce a synthesis gas having one part CO, one part hydrogen, and this can be then uh, uh, used uh, well, it can, it, it can undergo synthesis to uh, heavy hydrocarbons and waxes, 
on an iron catalyst, and that can be hydrocracked metal distillate. So those are two options that we have. Now, in the uh, first option, using natural gas, um, we might expect that a typical process would uh, consist of, first of all, uh, syngas generation using partial oxidation, perhaps on a fluid bed uh, nickel catalyst, and then the uh, synthesis gas uh, would be just the right stoichiometry to use a, a cobalt catalyst for fischer tropsch synthesis in a in my pick, my, my favorite reactor uh, for this purpose, a slurry bed reactor. And uh, we would produce heavy waxes, uh, paraffinic uh, liquids, and these would be then routed to a fixed bed hydroisomerization unit where we produce metal distillates, uh, which then would uh, be refined, but this is a high quality metal distillate feedstock which could be uh, transported by pipeline or tanker from the remote natural gas location uh, to the market. And so that uh, brings us to the subject of my talk. Uh, I'd like to focus today on the uh, fischer tropsch process and on that cobalt catalyst that would be used for natural gas uh, conversion. Uh, to liquids, and uh, especially um, I'd like to focus on the role of surface structure, support, and promoters. And the I would especially like to emphasize now uh, the following topics in this regard, or subtopics, the uh, activity selectivity properties, and, and basically what I want to emphasize today is catalyst design. And so these are the aspects of catalyst design that we'll be looking at. Effects of support and promoters, the role of surface structure and dispersion, uh, possible explanations of observed support effects, some principles of catalyst design, and some recent developments in, in um, cobalt catalyst technology. And I'm sure we'll be out of time by then, so we won't get to the last topic. <coughs> Getting a lot of static electricity here. I will try to not move around too much. Um, cobalt Fischer Tropsch catalyst. Uh, in my view, the most active and stable of the, of the synthesis catalysts. Selectivity of these catalysts, of, of cobalt, uh, can be varied from uh, methane, uh, primarily methane, 100% methane, to waxes. And the activity of cobalt uh, varies over four orders of magnitude at a given reaction condition, depending um, upon the, uh, and, and the selectivity varies a great deal, as I mentioned. And this all depends on the support, the promoter, the preparation, the metal loading, and perhaps the dispersion, although we'll address that issue. Now, uh, product distributions in fischer tropsch synthesis, as most of you know, are, are uh, vary over a wide range of hydrocarbons from gases to liquids uh, to waxes. And the product distribution conforms pretty much to what we call the anderson schultz flory polymerization model, uh, which predicts that, that uh, we will uh, get, uh, for example, at a polymerization probability of 0.75 that we'll get uh, this uh, distribution that you see here, where none of the uh, fractions here is more than 30% at a propagation probability of 0.75. Now the propagation probability, remember, is the probability of adding um, an, an additional carbon atom to the growing chain, and that propagation probability is thought to be reasonably constant uh, as a function of hydrocarbon number. Notice, though, as we go to higher propagation probabilities, uh, up to 0.95, that we get heavier products. And in fact, at a propagation probability 0.95, it's possible to get as much as 70% uh, selectivity to waxes and heavy liquids, uh, add those on, and we have maybe 80, 90%. So 
uh, we can we can get very high selectivities at that high range uh, or at the high end of the propagation probability. Now, if we're going to talk about activity selectivity <coughs> properties of uh, cobalt, uh, we really and, uh, need to talk too about the uh, unpromoted catalyst, because if we're going to talk about effects of promoters and supports, we really need to look at the baseline properties. And so uh, what we have here are the activities, selectivities, and propagation probabilities of some representative unpromoted cobalt, iron, and ruthenium fissiotrope synthesis catalysts. And these data uh, are valid at 480 <coughs> Kelvin, hydrogen CO ratio of 2 in one atmosphere. And uh, the data come from BYU and Berkeley, uh, from Bell's group. Uh, notice, first of all, that the CO turnover frequency here <coughs> is about a factor of 10 higher for cobalt relative to the iron and ruthenium catalysts. Let's move that up there so you can see it better. And uh, also notice that the propagation probability for uh, the unpromoted cobalt is the highest uh, about 0.9 uh, and much higher than for uh, ruthenium and very much higher than, than for uh, unsupported iron which is only 0.44. Uh, also notice that the olefin production is highest on iron uh, uh, about 94% uh, and lowest on cobalt about 54%. Uh, now that's the unpromoted materials and we know that supports and promoters can play an important role. And uh, this figure shows the effects of support. These are data from Rule and myself. And uh, they uh, are for cobalt on different supports at a 3% level, so a relatively low loading. And what you see here is that cobalt silica has a turnover frequency which is about the same as the unsupported cobalt. Cobalt alumina about a factor of two lower. Cobalt titania um, about five times higher. Cobalt uh, on magnesia, uh, it, it's uh, in the background here. In fact, what you see here is a range of activities uh, over three orders of magnitude, depending upon the support at this low metal loading. and. Uh, the extents of reduction of these catalysts vary quite a bit. And that could explain, for example, the low extent of re reduction of the 3% cobalt on alumina could explain its uh, lower activity, whereas the much, uh, the unexpectedly high activity of cobalt titanium could uh, be explained by a decoration effect, which uh, some people refer to as SMSI. Now, in the cobalt alumina system itself, uh, we find that there's a, a three order of magnitude variation in activity with uh, loading. And these data, this is again from Rule uh, uh, in our laboratory, you see that the turnover frequency varies from about 0.05 times 10 to the minus 3 to 60 times 10 to the minus 3 as we increase loading from 1 to 15 percent. Now at the same time, I should uh, emphasize that the 1 percent catalyst has a, an extent of reduction to the cobalt metal of only 10 percent. The uh, 15 percent catalyst uh, is well reduced and has about a 80, 90 percent uh, reduction to the metal depending upon the reduction temperature. Now, that, uh, we see that activity can vary over three orders of magnitude or, or, or more as a function of the support and loading at low metal loadings. Uh, from Rule's work, we also find that uh, the selectivity to hydrocarbons can vary uh, quite a bit. And uh, this shows the average carbon number uh, well, the dispersion plotted against average carbon number uh, for a series of cobalt catalysts at low loading on various supports. And what we see here is that the main correlation here is a uh, increasing uh, average carbon number for the product or increasing higher molecular weight 
uh, with uh, decreasing uh, dispersion. But again, I'd like to emphasize that the fully dispersed catalysts are the ones that are well reduced, and the highly dispersed catalysts are poorly reduced. And so this may, in fact, uh, relate more, the, the uh, higher molecular weight product may relate more to the catalyst being well reduced than to it being poorly dispersed. Now, these are some uh, interesting data from Cole and co-workers and show the effect of potassium promotion on cobalt. P uh, potassium is, is one of the most Im important promoters in fischer tropsch synthesis, especially for iron. In the case of cobalt, it turns out that you can certainly uh, significantly increase olefin make. And these data from Cole and co-workers show that um, if you add just a few tenths of a percent of potassium to a cobalt manganese uh, catal uh, catalyst, that you can increase uh, the olefin to paraffin ratio for C2s and C3s from uh, around 0.6 up to values in the range of 4 to 5. So it's a very significant uh, effect. Now, in this same, in this same study, Colin and co-workers showed that uh, just as much as, uh, uh, as little as a tenth of a percent of potassium would allow you to um, increase the C5 plus selectivity uh, very significantly on the order of uh, 20%. Of course, you do see about a 10% decrease in conversion, and so it, it uh, comes at, at that uh, sacrifice. Now, uh, it, it turns out that cobalt does not form a bulk carbide as does iron, but uh, it does form sulfides and borides. And in some work that was conducted in our laboratory by Jay Wang, uh, we found that the turnover frequency for cobalt boride is about a factor of 10 higher than for uh, the uh, unsupported cobalt itself. And furthermore, we found that uh, this was not only a stable catalyst, but it has a high uh, sulfur resistance as well. And the point is that by using various promoters, uh, it is possible to build in sulfur resistance. It's possible to change then the selectivity and activity of the uh, catalyst. Now, how can we... This uh, seems to be well grounded here. Um, how can we explain these very large variations in activity and selectivity on a given metal cobalt? Um, and uh, there uh, have been a number of groups that have suggested that structure sensitivity explains these uh, variations or ensemble effects. And um, then there have been other groups that suggested that these are support effects or uh, promoter effects. Well, why don't we address these two possibilities and look at some of the more recent data. Uh, data from Johnson and co-workers uh, show, uh, show here uh, carbon monoxide turnover frequencies at 485 Kelvin as a function of dispersion now for uh, uh, several different kinds of catalysts. Um, first of all, some some uh, cobalt catalysts that were prepared from carbonyl uh, uh, by decomposition of the carbonyl on a dehydroxylated support. And these show the temperatures of, of dehydroxylation. Also some, uh, some data here for cobalt, single crystal cobalt on a, a well, actually cobalt overlayers on a tungsten single crystals. Notice they are 100% dispersion and we have uh, quite a range of dispersion for these cobalt carbonyl catalysts. They're compared with data for a 10% cobalt on aluminum prepared uh, by a conventional preparation, and also a polycrystalline cobalt, which I prepared at Sandia by destroying a single crystal um, <laughs> and trying to clean it. And uh, so you have quite a range of catalysts here, and what you see is that the activities fall into two groups. The uh, first one is 
the well reduced catalyst, and, and you can see that activity here is high and invariant with dispersion over the range of 0 to 100 percent. On the other hand, the poorly reduced catalyst, you have a significant decrease in activity with increasing dispersion. The uh, data for the well-reduced catalyst suggests that uh, the CO hydrogenation, at least on well-reduced cobalt catalysts, is structure insensitive. Furthermore, the uh, data from Johnson and co-workers uh, show that the turnover frequency uh, increases with increasing extent of reduction. So uh, suggesting maybe uh, a supporter promoter effect here. And uh, you can see that when we get up to about 70% reduction, that there is no further increase in the activity. So it's, it's pretty uh, much uh, reached the maximum activity uh, in the range of 70 to 100%. Uh, a reduction. Now, th that data suggests then that uh, we may have an effect of unreduced cobalt on the activity. Some uh, data from Iglesia and co-workers uh, certainly support uh, the, the data of, of Johnson and co-workers uh, in uh, suggesting that cobalt uh, well, CO hydrogenation on cobalt is structure insensitive, and furthermore, their data show that on uh, well-reduced cobalt at, at re reasonably low dispersions, CO hydrogenation activity is independent of support as well. And what you see here is cobalt time yield, which is the uh, rate expressed in moles of CO converted per second per um, per gram atom of metal increases linearly with dispersion, both for cobalt and ruthenium. And from this, we can conclude then that the turnover frequency or site time yield then is independent of dispersion for both cobalt and ruthenium catalysts of high, uh, high extent of reduction and low dispersion. Furthermore, they show for the um, a, a similar group of cobalt catalysts of relatively high loading, high extent of reduction, low, low dispersion, that the selectivity uh, for hydrocarbons uh, as a function of carbon number here is reasonably independent of support. Now, uh, from these uh, two uh, studies, uh, we can conclude that CO hydrogenation on cobalt is probably structure insensitive, at least if we have highly reduced catalysts, and that on poorly dispersed, highly reduced cobalt, activity is independent of support. But then you're going to ask, but what about these uh, low activities of the well dispersed, poorly, re poorly reduced cobalt on different supports? And what about the unexpectedly high activity that we see uh, uh, for cobalt on titanium? Well, if I had time, I would tell you about um, a number of studies that uh, show these are very likely due to support promoter effects. These are studies in our laboratory, domestics, uh, Faulkner's laboratory that uh, show that there are different kinds of support and, and promoter effects and that undoubtedly uh, some other laboratories and I'm going to get myself in trouble. Um, but what these studies show is that um, uh, decoration of small metal crystallites, localized uh, electronic modifications of the cl small clusters in some cases um, due to the interaction with the support and bifunctional catalysis and uh, promotion or inhibition by, by cobalt or iron oxides can explain the, the large variations in activity and selectivity in these systems of, of poorly reduced and low loading, uh, well, uh, well dispersed catalysts. But uh, that, we'll leave that topic for another day. And I'll go on to tell you that uh, as a result of numerous uh, well-defined studies in the last two decades and, and 
by quite a number of people here in this audience um, and, and others who are not here, we have been able to get a better understanding of activity structure relationships in Fisher Trobe. And in fact, there are quite a number of, import, of important catalyst design principles that we could talk about that have result from, from this, uh, these many studies over the past two decades. I list just a few of them here. Um, well, we've already talked about uh, uh, what we have learned about structure sensitivity and supports. And in addition to that, we have learned that the hydrocarbon selectivity <coughs> and steady state Fisher Trope synthesis is uh, really predicted very well by Anderson Schultz Flory uh, kinetics and that it doesn't really work. We can't really break the ASF uh, kinetics by means of promoters and supports and high metal dispersions or even shape selective zeolites. Um, but what we can do is we can push to the high propagation probabilities and get a high selectivity of waxes and liquids. Second, uh, within the constraints of uh, ASF, uh, it is possible to get a high yield of olefins and branch products, depending upon support and, and uh, promoter. Or we can get high waxes. So we really can move the product distribution around quite a bit. And third, it's possible to take the zeolites and acid supports and take the products from the fischer tropsch reaction and do cracking and uh, isomerization and other kinds of secondary reactions. And so we can, we can really change the uh, product distribution that way. And finally, uh, we have learned that through variations in pretreatment preparation and reaction conditions, we can get almost um, an infinite variation in the composition and structure of group eight metals on various kinds of supports. And these, in turn, determine the catalyst's unique activity and selectivity properties. So there's, there's no limit, just a, a, you know, we're only limited by our imagination as to what kinds of products we can get from uh, fischer tropsch synthesis. And now I'd like to mention, as a result of these uh, numerous studies over the past decade and our understanding of, of activity structure relationships, there have been a number of important developments in uh, cobalt fischer tropsch catalyst technology. And um, I would like to mention just seven of those. Um, the first two, uh, which are very significant, include the developments at Shell um, and Exxon of, uh, first of all, catalysts that are promoted with zirconia, titania, or chromium to maximize uh, wax production. And, uh, the high activity cobalt rhenium and cobalt ruthenium on titania catalysts uh, developed at Exxon. Both of these which produce a high fraction of waxes and, and liquids uh, for the wax crack technology. Um, the development at Shell of uh, catalysts with cobalt in the outer shell of the pellet to improve C5 plus selectivity. Uh, the development of cobalt uh, carbonyl derived catalysts, which are active, well dispersed, and highly reduced at, at rel reasonably low loadings. Uh, some of that work in our laboratory. The uh, cobalt potassium manganese oxide catalyst, which I talked about already, with a high olefin selectivity. And in the, um, uh, uh, the same study by colleague co workers, the discovery of a high activity body center cubic cobalt, which is apparently is produced during fischer tropsch synthesis at high pressures, um, five atmospheres, 220 degrees centigrade after about 100, 150 hours. And finally, the cobalt boride uh, work, which I mentioned, where, which you get a, um, a catalyst which is even more active than cobalt with a uh, high sulfur resistance. Now, I, I would I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fine work of uh, Panel and Kibbe uh, as an example of one of these uh, developments. I'd like to work and mention the work at Gulf End at Exxon, in which uh, we uh, uh, find the development of a very active uh, cobalt ruthenium catalyst. Now, the uh, work by Panel and Kibbe at Gulf Research in the late 70s and early 80s 
uh, resulted in the uh, development of a cobalt ruthenium catalyst which allowed a reduction in the uh, cobalt loading from about 50 to uh, 20 percent uh, on a uh, in a co the cobalt thoria alumina system and these are these are very active catalysts notice that both catalysts here have about the same um, conversion activity and the same uh, product distribution uh, at Exxon the Glacian co-workers um, have done a uh, did, did a number of studies over a period of years and, and these have just been published recently in 1991 through 93 in which they show that ruthenium uh, provides a, a marvelous catalyst system which has a number of unique properties and, and uh, one of the first of these is that ruthenium facilitates the reduction of cobalt and this is shown here in this TGA work where you can see that the derivative here of the weight change reaches a maximum at a much lower temperature I'm running out of time uh, so I will speed along here it, um, the, their work shows that you get less carbon formation above 600 uh, degrees centigrade and you can see that very little on the uh, cobalt ruthenium this means you get less of, uh, you can also uh, regenerate that catalyst more easily. And this data here that shows that uh, when you plot the turnover frequency as a function of dispersion, of course you, you see that structure insensitivity um, uh, that we talked about earlier, but you see here the, the points for the cobalt ruthenium. There definitely is a synergistic effect on activity and you get a higher activity of three to five times uh, higher for the uh, cobalt ruthenium catalyst. And finally, you see uh, substantially higher C5 plus selectivity for the catalyst, which is a cobalt ruthenium, which has been uh, calcined relative to cobalt and uh, the uncalcined cobalt ruthenium. Well, wrapping up then, in uh, summary, uh, we can say that Unsupported cobalt is uh, about 10 times more active than uh, ruthenium or, or iron. That the uh, activity and selectivity of cobalt can be modified with promoters or with metal additives uh, to increase activity, selectivity for waxes, or selectivity for olefins. And that CO hydrogenation on cobalt is structure insensitive that is, the specific activity is independent of initial surface structure and dispersion. That at low to moderate dispersions and metal loadings, you can get large variations in activity and selectivity. And that these can be ascribed to metal support interactions um, and promoter effects. But at high metal loadings, low to moderate dispersions and high extensive reduction, the activity selectivity properties of cobalt are independent of support and dispersion. And finally, there have been some important advances uh, made in the preparation um, and second and third generation Fisher Tropsch catalysts uh, have been developed. Some of these are being demonstrated in large pilot and full scale plants such as the one in Malaysia. Thank you very much for your attention. Questions, we're a little bit uh, over our time, so make them short. This was University Karlsruhe. Uh, I feel your activity comparisons, they are pretty nice and they uh, correlate nicely. However, you uh, need uh, the turnover and frequencies, need uh, uh, chemisorption measurements, and what you are measuring before the reaction with a fresh catalyst. These must not be the fisher tropsch sites in a working system. Perhaps it might be nicer to make these kinds of measurements after the reaction, or even if it's a little doubtful what one measures this kind of option. Yes. But, but I, I see the I'm happy to report nice. that they do not uh, change very much in the case of cobalt yeah. when you measure them before and after. It depends, though, on how much carbon you deposit. Okay, let's move on. Thank you very much. Let's let people...
sort of confusing and how 